Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law Faculty Book Talk Series. I am Teresa Miguel Stearns, Associate Dean and Director of the Law Library. And this afternoon's book talk features Professor Paul Bennett in conversation with Professor Sylvia West. They will be discussing the second edition of Professor Bennett's book, A Short and Happy Guide to Being a Lawyer, which he co-authored with the late Kenny Hagland, to whom this edition is dedicated. Also with us today is Professor Hagland's wife, the Honorable Barbara Sattler, and several of his law school classmates. A very special welcome to all of you. We are so honored that you could join us for this very special event today. A Short and Happy Guide to Being a Lawyer is a friendly and helpful companion for law students and new lawyers as they venture forth. It is a concise and entertaining tour of some basic lawyering skills from problem solving to making deals to trying cases. Paul Bennett is a clinical professor of law and co-director of the clinics at the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law. Professor Bennett joined the Arizona Law Faculty in 1996 after teaching for several years at Cornell Law School. Since arriving at Arizona Law, Professor Bennett has been the director of the Child and Family Law Clinic. He also teaches professional responsibility, juvenile law, law and humanities. Uh, Professor Bennett has also taught law as a visiting faculty member at the University of Washington, University of Tennessee, and University of San Diego Law School. Professor Bennett graduated from Cornell Law School in 1976 in upstate New York, first in Orleans Legal Aid Bureau in rural Albion, and then to Mark County Neighborhood Legal Services in Ithaca. From 1983 to 1988, Professor Bennett was an assistant city attorney in Ithaca, New York, primarily working on housing and building code enforcement. He was then in private practice with the Ithaca law firm of Holberg, Galbraith, Holmberg, Orkin, and Bennett until 1993 when he started teaching full time. In 2004 to 2006, Professor Bennett co chaired the State Bar of Arizona's Task Force on Professionalism. He is currently a member of the Arizona Supreme Court Commission on Diversity, Equality, and Justice, where he works on issues relating to disproportionate minority contacts in juvenile justice and diversity within the Arizona judiciary. With Professor Lett today is uh, with Professor Bennett today is <laughs> Professor Sylvia Lett, an associate professor of legal writing at the University of, of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law, where she teaches a variety of subjects, including uh, criminal procedure and introduction to U.S. law. She has also developed and taught multiple online courses in our U.S. in our global and the law school's global programs. She is the proud recipient of the law school's 2019. Association of American Law Schools Teacher of the Year Award. Professor Lett fell in love with teaching years ago when she taught at the law school while working full time as an assistant federal public defender, where she represented death row inmates in their federal habeas appeals. Prior to her uh, capital appeals practice, Professor Lett worked as a civil litigator in Manhattan and Phoenix law firm and as a judicial law clerk for both the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Arizona State Court of Appeals. Deeply interested in child welfare, Professor Lett volunteered as a court-appointed special advocate for 17 years and served as a foundational board member for a tuition-free private school in downtown Tucson for children from low-income families. More recently, Professor Lett is founding member of Maria, Mothers Against Racism in America, a fledgling group of Mom micro activists, her words, committed to dismantling racism in law schools, uh, racism in schools. <laughs> Professor Lett is committed to civil, to civil liberties and she serves on the legal panel of the ACLU of Arizona, where she is a former board member and as a community advisory board member of ABCM Public Media. She also serves on uh, on both the State Board and the Southern Arizona Steering Committee of the Arizona Women Lawyers Association. She is also a member of the Arizona Minority Bar Association. She also like graduated from Harvard <laughs> and received her JD from New York University School of Law. 
please join me in welcoming and Professor so. Bennett and Lett, as well as family and friends of Professor Peggy Hagler for this very special event this afternoon. Now we're on. Thank you for allowing me to be the moderator for this book. Um, I have such vivid memories of first meeting Professor Hagler. Uh, he came to my short story club and he told me, I don't really like short stories, but I like Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> and, and after getting to spend some time with him, he invited me to join uh, your wonderful Lawn Humanities course uh, that is co-taught with, or was co-taught with Professor Hagler, and also uh, still includes lots of uh, of Tucson's legal luminaries, including uh, retired Honorable uh, Judge, Honorable Barbara Sattler, um, Professor Hickman's wife, and retired Professor Bill Boyd, uh, among others. So Professor Hickman had just such a larger-than-life personality, and I was hoping um, for those in the audience who haven't had the pleasure of, uh, of knowing him, could you tell us a little bit about how you became such good friends and collaborators? Well, started on day one, um, Professor Hagelin was originally hired at the law school to be a clinical professor. And then sort of as he evolved and moved to other things, uh, uh, I became in 96 and 97, the first new clinical professor hired in many, many, many years. And he was supported from day one because he loved the clinic. I'm going to tell you a little story. Just tell you a little bit about his personality. The first day I met him, um, after I came back here, I, I did meeting when I interviewed uh, and started, and we about to start a clinic in a couple of weeks. He asked me what book I was going to use for the class. And I said, well, I'll probably use a book called Lawyers as Counselors, which many clinic people are familiar with. He said, oh, great. Go read the acknowledgments. So I look at the acknowledgments, and it says, he didn't write the book. It says to Kenny Hagelin, who's primarily responsible for Chapter 24. <laughs> That's really cool. He said, no, no, no. You got to go look at chapter 24. And there was no chapter 24. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that did it right there. I mean, I, this is a guy I need to hang around with. <laughs> Happy guys. Um, is the only guy that Walter Squirrels uh, Lures publishes that is not on a specific legal subject. Um, but as the introduction of the first edition, who was written by a different professor of law, noted, the book is a blueprint for success in law and life, and that in it, both Professor Hegland and you captured the magic and promise of our craft. So I'm wondering, how did the book come about, and um, what were, are you and Professor Hegland trying to achieve? Oh, well, it's two questions. How did it come about? I don't know. Um, he was approached, I think, because uh, Kenny had written a number of nutshell books that people find really useful and uh, decided to, can we write something even more condensed in a nutshell? So it's just short and happy. I, maybe there's no word for something smaller than a nutshell. <laughs> and uh, we've been doing a lot of projects together, just having a lot of fun. We talk a lot of communities together. We did the juvenile detention teaching program together. We even did a law camp for a number of summers. Um, for kids who would otherwise not be able to go to a camp. And uh, so he said, let's write it. Okay, let's write it. Um, I think our goal was to kind of be a pep talk for people who are young and new in the profession. Uh, we'll give you some information, but we want to do it in an entertaining way. And we want to let you know that being a lawyer is kind of cool. It's, it's a great profession. Uh, there's so much to it. There's so much variety. There's so many really good moments in being a lawyer. And so that was our goal. And throw so a little, you know, knowledge in while we do it. To me, as I was rereading the book to prepare for this, it's uh, to me the book would be great for law students to read now for, for advice, but then also uh, for practitioners to read as a security blanket. You know, I can see reading it before every trial because it really reminded me not only of practical skills, but how to stay true to my own, you know, inner compass. Um, and, and that judgment that, that comes with, with being a good lawyer. And I noticed that um, in addition to having a ton of humor, the, the book, for, for those of you who haven't read it yet, it will make you laugh out loud in parts. Uh, the book uses lots of quotes and, and references to great effect. And, and I was struck that virtually none of them are legal in nature. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, about that and using the, the 
unconventional examples to, to paint such vivid pictures? Well, to start with, Professor Hagelin once wrote a law review article called Quibbles. So you know that he's not going to be conventional in any sense. <laughs> um, but I think both of us see law as part of a bigger picture, just being part of humanity's life. That's why we have the law in humanity's course. Uh, and we think that, that examples and quotes from other sources allow students and young lawyers to make connections. Because law is all about making connections like this, like that. We make those kind of arguments all the time. And to see the connections don't have to be narrow. Um, they can be very broad. You know, you can quote Mark Twain and learn something about law. You can quote uh, Eddie Law and, and learn something about law and, and your practice of law. Because, you know, part of this book is, go ahead, you can do this. You know, this is, this is within your grasp. I, I love the, the Dolly Parton quote, don't get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. And another quote, it may be your hundredth case, but it's your client's first. And I was just wondering, do you have a particular favorite? A favorite quote? Yeah, a favorite. A favorite. Yeah, there was one from Will Rogers. Um, and it was in a little, everything here is just a little snippet. A little snippet about be prepared for the unexpected when you tell a story, it's okay to lead with the unexpected and just take people in a different direction than they thought. And his quote was, um, when I die, I want to die the way my father did, quietly in his sleep, not like the passengers in his car. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the process of writing, uh, of jointly writing a book uh, and having it kind of coalesce into one unifying voice must be really difficult. And, and getting to know Professor Hagelin uh, and getting to know you, you're, you're very different people with, with wonderful but very different personalities. Um, I'm just wondering who did what in the book and, and how, did you, how did you figure that out? In the first edition, we just kind of assigned stuff to each other. But in, in this edition, and uh, when we were putting it together uh, before Tank passed away, um, we wanted to make that a little more senior. We didn't want it to be a good fall section, a penny section. And so we deliberately changed our voice slightly, not a lot, but with different kinds of examples and using the same kind of cadence um, that each other used a little bit. And hopefully it's relatively seamless. You can't say, oh, that's that is part, that's taken the part. Because we want it to be an enjoyable experience for people. And if it, if it switches tones too much, it's, it's difficult to read. So I, I know when we were preparing and talking a little bit about this, that, that you had told me in terms of, of thinking of, of both of you coming to one voice, you said that um, that Professor Hagelin's kind of worldview was like, plans are useless. And, and your word, worldview is planning is essential. And, and can you talk a little bit about how, you know, how do you recognize you know, reconcile those two very different philosophies. We spent 20 years doing that with each other. So Kenny's <laughs> um, the most creative person I ever met. Um, he just thought outside the box in, in a different way. And it was always original. And it was always, I have an idea. Let's do whatever. Or I just read a book and it's the best book of all time. Um, whatever you read down to. Um, and he was all about spontaneity. And, and in some ways, that's how we... We continue to teach law and humanities is, is let it go, let it see where it flows. Um, but I'm also someone who you know was teaching young lawyers a little bit about trial work and, and about being a lawyer. And, and to me, being a lawyer is all about being more prepared than the other side. Uh, and that you want to be the person most prepared in the negotiation, you know, court hearing, and whatever you're doing than anybody else in the room. Um, so we kind of compromise. Uh, because you don't want to take away that spontaneity. And in fact, if you don't, I think the more you work to develop instinctual skills, the more you can be creative in your mind, in whatever you're doing, but it requires a lot of preparation. So I'm sure that when it's out permanent plays a violin, he's done a ton of practice, but he's also in the moment being able to use that preparation to be a genius and be creative. Um, so we, you know, we compromised on a few things in that direction. Um, one of them was we were looking for something to illustrate planning and at the same time illustrate 
his resistance to plans. And we found a quote from General Eisenhower at Norm just after Normandy, which said that uh, plans are useless, but planning is essential. And we kind of use it to, you know, to meld those two things together. Um, as a legal writing professor, I, I love um, I love Professor Hickland's advice about getting rid of the little darlings in, in your writing and how you could you know be working so hard on something and you, you've written it and you think it looks beautiful, but if it just doesn't work, you've got to be willing to, to, to let it go. Uh, and I think that that's that that's great advice. Um, I know that Professor Hagelin wrote another very well regarded short and happy guide uh, that's well known that uh, that's on elder law. Uh, and I know that you are also currently working on another short and happy guide. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and what we can look forward to reading. Uh, when I'm done, <laughs> <laughs> it's due sometime in December. I'll be looking at the semester, but I'm going to write a, a, a short and happy guide to clinics and experts. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of the same style of book, uh, informational for students who are making a choice or in the middle of doing what they're doing, you know, just some practical advice, not geared towards any specific kind of clinic or any specific kind of externship. And so trying to do, you know, accomplish the same thing, make it entertaining, but make it informational. And, you know, pep talks are good, I think. You know, kind of, a lot of this book is, is kind of locker room stuff, you know, you put it on the bulletin board. And you hope that that little quote or whatever it is connects somewhere. It's a, I think we both believe that, that teaching is not about giving knowledge. It's more about planting seeds, uh, some kind of recognition. Uh, and both of us talk a lot about later on when someone would come up to us and say, oh, you know, when you said this in class, now that resonates with me. I remember that happened once with Kenny and I. Kenny looked at me saying, did I ever say that? <laughs> but, but it, you know, we, we hope that that's how it works, that, that, that we teach, we mentor, we we also uh, emulate lawyers, we, especially in the clinic world and the legal writing world. Um, and we hope that, you know, maybe a little part of that rubs off and later on someone finds that useful. I think that's such a great way to describe this book. Um, for me, it's kind of like, there's such a difference between what you learn in law school and then the actual practice of law and then sometimes when you're out actually practicing law, it's like you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. So this book to me, it, it kind of it fills in those blanks ahead of time and it, and it gives you good common sense um, advice on, on how to plan and how things that you should be thinking about as you're applying all the skills that you learned in law school, which, which I think which I think is invaluable. Um, I know you talked a little bit about this, but can you talk a little bit more about kind of what changed between the first and second edition? Because I know you made some some mindful decisions in the second edition. Uh, a couple of things. I mean, one, we added some things that we just didn't include in the first edition. Um, so we added, thanks to Professor Bergman, who's around, um, because I've been working on her deposition class. Um, I think many of you have too. Uh, a section on depositions, because we thought that was important. Plus, it got rid of one of Kenny's lines, his little darling. I didn't really like on <laughs> depositions. All I need to say about them is that they're boring. Um, we thought we'd give a more helpful advice than that. Um, got rid of a lot of darlings. It just kind of read the book as if, because uh, it's been eight years uh, in between. Uh, ooh, what might I put in now? How am I thinking now? Uh, same with him. You know, what what's changed? What do we what have we learned in the last eight years? Because one of the best things about law is you're always learning something new, always. You know, there's no day that goes by where something is going to pop up. And you say, uh, so that was kind of it. It was kind of like that. I was looking at an old draft and and, uh, and trying to put in stuff that I thought was either more up to date or not. We, we also, you know, confession, the first book was written by two old white guys. And I think our references were not as diverse as they ought to have been. So we, we added a lot of, of, I think, really wise sayings and quotes from, from a more diverse uh, section of our community. That was definitely appreciated. I, I noticed that. So, so it was nice to see. Um, so <laughs> you keep telling me that, that you left an intentional typo in the book. And I, 
as a legal writing professor, I should be able to find it. <laughs> I haven't come across it yet. And I, I guess, I, well, I guess you probably don't want to share it with us, but I wonder if there's a story behind it or a why behind it. Uh, short story is uh, as genius as Kenny Hagelin was, and he is, was, uh, and he can't spell. <laughs> Never can spell. And so there's a typo in there. That, uh, the first time I read it, I went, oh my God, no. <laughs> and then I realized it's kind of funny. I'm teasing you guys because I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> it's right there. I double checked. Um, but it was just one of those kind of uh, strange typos that uh, turned out to be humorous. So I left it in. Do we have any questions from from our, our live or our virtual audience or Professor Husby? Thank you. Okay, thank you for this. Um, thank you to Kenny and everybody that's probably running around the galaxy laughing, creating. Um, Kenny is just really fun person. Um, so uh, I have read the first one and I find it humorous. I mean, I laughed out loud. I haven't had a chance to read the second one, but we assign parts of it to our students. Um, and I think it's funny in part because I practiced um, and taught for like a long time. So I'm wondering um, how you might suggest, you know, we assign parts of it, but, but we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about it. So I'm wondering sort of how you might talk about it, talk about your book or aspects of your book with students, particularly those students who are the cynical law students, over ambitious law students who don't think it's funny uh, to be a lawyer <laughs> and it's serious business. Um, so, any advice in that regard? Well, I don't believe this book or anybody else can change anybody's personality. <laughs> but I think you can, um, we can, all of us as teachers, can model behavior and model attitudes and Hope that that just gives them a little bit of thought. Or you may pick something in there. Like one of the things that, that Kenny taught me, and that we didn't include in the first three, so we put in the second, was just the value of science, silence, of saying nothing. And not thinking that meant people are disengaged, but that they're thinking, because they haven't said anything. Uh, and using that perhaps in a courtroom in a couple different ways. Um, so, if you have someone who's that serious that this isn't the book for them, but it's not the book for them, um, then take a couple of little pieces of advice that are in there about lawyers and just explore it a little bit with students. And I think you can do that. I mean, I'm not saying it, it, it appeals to everybody because it doesn't. We weren't, we weren't trying to do that. What we were trying to do was appeal to people who are embarking on this great adventure of being a lawyer and maybe let them think it's a good thing. And, I, I loved your section on the power of silence and then the power of within that silence learning how to listen and the listening to understand and there's even parts in it that I think people can use not just in lawyering but in life you know how to actively listen and how to how to interview someone and give it back to them to make sure that you're really getting what it is that that they're saying and I just think that that's that's invaluable. I think that's probably next to being able to be the most important lawyer skill you can have because you have to listen to your clients. You have to understand where they're coming from. And they need you to let them know that you do understand because there's nothing worse than talking to somebody and thinking they're not really paying attention. They don't get me. They don't understand me. It's a powerful human emotion. Uh, but it also makes you a better lawyer. It means that you now have a path or at least a goal that you can create a path to. I really get what my client wants. And so we, we didn't want to stress that, that, that listening is such a, just an incredibly important skill. And then you, at every stage, you listen to the other side to see what their arguments are. You listen to the judge. And you also listen to try to read between the lines to see what people are really saying. Because a lot of times people don't say what they really mean. Um, they, they're embarrassed or they're, they're nervous or they're angry or something else takes over. Well, they simply don't have the, the verbal space to be able to do that. We were in court one day, we almost included this in the book, we decided not to um, the first time around. It was a domestic violence case, it's serious business. And 
our client was asked by the judge, well, what, what happened? What did he do? And, well, he used verbal language at us. And we know that doesn't make any sense, right? But we know what that person means. So both the judge and, and we uh, made the case based on that. That, that we, he really understood. The judge asked some follow-up questions, but he did. But but that that kind of thing is is really important for us as lawyers is to make sure that we're really hearing what people are saying and taking the time to do that. It takes time. It took me a long time in practice to realize that what I might have thought was the best resolution or what I wanted for a client was not necessarily what the client was telling me that 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 he or she wanted or they wanted. So it's really interesting. I saw another hand up. Yeah, there's, oh, there's, 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 there's a question in the chat uh, for Professor Bennett from Edna Aguirre. Um, <laughs> <what is that? laughs> um, I happen to be married to Edna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still new here. No secret. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the most important thing you learned from Professor Hagelin? <laughs> Boy, that's a hard answer. Thanks, Ed. That's a hard question. <laughs> I think the most important thing I learned from Penny more than anything else was don't be afraid to try something new. Uh, we did a lot of stuff together, and it worked exactly like this. He'd come into my office and say, I've got this great idea. It was never my idea. <laughs> and uh, why don't we start a law camp? Why don't we start a veterans course? Why don't we, whatever it may be, and uh, and every single time I shook my head and said, what are you doing? What are we doing? The next thing you know, we're doing it. And we're able to do it and, and maybe help some people in the process. So I think more than anything, I, that's what I learned from Tim. Go with it. Try it out. Don't be afraid. Take a risk. Because once you find it, it will work out. When Kenny inscribed uh, the first edition, he gave me a copy one day, kind of out of the blue, and, and he did should have brought it because the inscription is something like, you know, dear Sylvia, you know, keep searching out the weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> yeah, I had a question uh, about the pandemic and Zoom court. Um, I'm thinking about the timing of maybe when you had to turn it into the publisher and the timing of Penny's passing and, and that, but. I'm just wondering if you wrote anything in the book about, you know, doing doing things differently, like Zoom court. And uh, if you didn't write anything about that in the book, do you have any words of wisdom for people becoming lawyers who are uh, doing Zoom court? Uh, okay, no, we didn't. The timing was off. Right. Um, we, we really Thanks. didn't know how expansive the pandemic was going to be. Uh, we started right at the right beginning of the stuff. Uh, advice to people, well, you know, there's practical advice. You know, what's in the background? Are you wearing pants? Um, <laughs> those kinds of things. Uh, but the other one is, uh, you know, as lawyers, we, we've talked about this with CLE. Make sure it's a private setting. Make sure nobody else is listening in. Uh, you know, so go back to the basics of being a lawyer. Make sure that you know you're having a private conversation with your client, or that the people you're negotiating with, you know who's on that room. And so all the Zoom protocols, the passwords, and waiting rooms, and things like that, are all so important. And the other thing is that uh, if it's something like a classroom, um, at least when we were all Zoom, it's a whole lot harder hybrid. Uh, make sure everybody's face is lit up. I can, I can see you. You can see me, and we communicate as directly as we can, even though it's, it's virtual. Um, but other than that, I, I think you just go back to the basic skills that we all have, which is, you know, take your time, be clear, uh, give people a chance to respond. Um, and I think, you know, your students are great. They're fantastic. And they will pick it up in a different, in fact, it's more comfortable for them probably. But they'll pick it up in that, in that medium, in that way of communicating. The, uh, Next internship book we'll talk about at least working remotely because that will be a phenomenon that we'll all the way experience. Before I forget, I just wanted to throw out too the book. What struck me is you know, legal writing, we, we think a lot about you know metacognition and self-reflection and, and how much the book really encourages people to develop your self 
you know, best practices for yourself and after taking a deposition, after a trial, going and actually taking notes so you really have something tangible to look at and reflect back on and say, how, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? And um, I thought that was great. I think it's important. I mean, it's important. It's how we learn. And uh, most often we learn by screwing up. You know, we make mistakes. We do things when we wish we had done them differently. But but if we just vote about it, then we're not advancing ourselves, we're not developing. If we look back and say, okay, why did I do it that way? Okay, this next time I'm going to do it this way. And, and even when you do something really well, um, why, why did that work? I wonder why that worked so well. Maybe next time I'll do it even better. And that's that's a, it's a process for all of us, and it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop even when you're my age, it, it's always ongoing. And I think as clinicians, that's one of our number one goals is to teach that skill. Taking a little time afterwards and thinking about what you did uh, so you can be better next time. Or you can learn more the next time. I have two questions in the chat. So the first from the Honorable Barbara Sattler, questions of Paul. Um, Having written a book with someone, would you do it again with someone else or prefer to write alone? Mm -hmm. Let me give you a little backstory here. Because <laughs> Judge Sattler uh, and Professor Hagelin wrote a novel together. Oh. If you think this was hard, I can, and it's pretty good. You know, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's actually even hard to tell who is writing which part, which is even better. Um, I don't know, maybe. I think I, it, it really depends on who the partner is. And if it's someone that you think you don't have to agree on stuff, but that you can work with. Um, when I was first a clinic teacher, um, we had a trial set on the day of graduation. So one of the other clinic professors and I said, OK, we'll go do the trial in the morning all of those people with their families. And he's one of my closest friends. And he, he's actually the person who performed the marriage ceremony for one of my daughters. And we didn't fit at all in that trial. It was a disaster. We think it was one anyway, but but it was still, you know, it just wasn't working. Um, you have to choose who you work with wisely. Uh, it can't be someone you're so close with that, that you know you might get offended or emotionally involved. But they say get rid of that little darling. Um, but it also needs to be someone that you feel uh, a connection to enough, and at least in work. I don't know, we can ask her the same question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll move on to the second question. Um, and this is from Professor Aaron Simulitz. There's such, uh, there's so much great advice for all seasons in the book, such as success is not the key to happiness, happiness is the key to success. And reputation trumps class standing and never talk down to anyone. How do we ensure that we are emphasizing those lessons as part of the law school curriculum in addition to assigning the book? Well, two things pop in my head. Um, one is model the behavior. Just model the behavior. You know, when we say don't be rude, don't be rude. It's not hard to not be rude. You just have to take a deep breath sometimes and then that kind of chatter <laughs> um, but, but model the behavior because I think. I don't mean to stereotype students, but they're kind of like teenagers. They, they may not listen, but they hear absolutely everything, and they see absolutely everything. And so they're watching, and, and they're choosing who they want to emulate, or what skill they want to emulate, or what posture they want to emulate. So for us, it's let's be good models. And I can't say I always am, you know, uh, but, but if you're conscious of it, you'll do it more often than, than you won't. Second thing is, I think, um, and this may be a part of your Zoom question. I think at some point we need to get to know students personally. So be open to talking to them when they feel like they have need to talk. They come up to you after class, or so if you see something, maybe you reach out to them, or make sure that that door is open for them to be able to just discuss stuff with you. And it, it doesn't have to be about the class. It can be about life. It can be about anything. And I think you'll find that that. that I think the best teachers, and, and I'm seeing a bunch of legal writing professors here, and I think you're the best, you really are, are really open to that, exceptionally open to students coming to them and just asking questions and not feeling like there's some big barrier between us. I went to a 
Red Sox Dodgers game with my brother a few years ago, and he sat in the hall. You can he said so. so you could imagine that if, if you will. <laughs> and I don't know, about three months later, a student came up to me and said, uh, Were you at the Dodger game? <laughs> at the Dodger Red Sox game? Yeah. In the all you can eat section? Yeah. Sure, a couple rows behind you. I thought you were a law professor. And I said, Why didn't you say hello? And he said, Well, we didn't think law professors would go to Dodger games. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully he later became a clinic student and now we, we have a much more open you know conversation um but we're not don't be aloof we, we shouldn't be aloof um, we're here to teach and, and help your result my question i guess it's kind of related to what extent do you think um lawyers need to explain to their clients what it is they're doing like so where is the boundary to helping a non-lawyer understand what it is. And my thoughts about this, of course, have shifted because I've, in the past, I've hired lawyers for various things, like I've litigated a book contract and I work as, work as an expert in some information. But now that I'm studying, I'm just seeing just how little I have any comprehension about what the law is that was at stake and how impervious uh, this whatever this barrier is just so i can't really imagine trying to translate that to someone who is a client so and then of course you, you kind of mentioned being respectful to and make listening to what they want what a client wants but also they might have an idea that they think is a strategy which of course you you, you know they're playing tv shows with little lawyers who who uh for their clients and their clients ideas so can you speak a little bit about that back and forth? Well, first of all, I think it's our obligation to explain things to our clients in a way that they can understand uh, so that they can make the decisions for themselves. Because in the end, most of the important decisions are there. Do I sell this case? Do I go to trial? Do I accept this purchase offer? Whatever it may be, it's, it's their choice. It's not ours. It's not our life. It's theirs. And I think we have a not just a, we have a written ethical obligation, but I think we, we have a, a larger obligation to make sure that we're respecting the fact that it's, it's, it's not my life, it's yours. It's not about me, it's about you, client. And we all have that skill, I think, within us to not talk law, not speak legalese. Um, I had the advantage of having a number of jury trials. You can't speak legalese to juries. I mean, I'm not going to win, I'm going to go to sleep, and then they'll vote for the other side. Um, so you have to be able to explain things. And I'm not saying dumb it down, not by any means. But the second part of your question is really important because sometimes clients have solutions that will indicate or be at least a red flag to you that you're not going in the right direction. And we actually talked about that in the book, uh, about a person who's being evicted and assuming that person wants us to defend the eviction, but maybe what they really want is to find alternative housing or to build a house or to do something different. And I think that's the other part of it. So we, it's a, it's a two-way communication. We call it a lawyer-client relationship, not a contract. It's a relationship, and in any relationship, there has to be good communication. So, it, but it's a skill like anything else. It's a skill like playing the piano or covering first base on a ground ball to the right side. You got to practice it, and you got to develop it, and you got to see. Oh, today I was explaining something, and I saw a blade dodge. Maybe I can say that a different way, uh, and just keep working at it. And I think the best lawyers are able to do that. They're able to communicate complex legal issues uh, in ways that their clients can understand. It's kind of like going to Professor Masaro's class and listening to incredibly complex constitutional issues and then walking up and saying, oh, I think I know. Because she has that call. And so we should just try. It. It's a skill. Just keep working on it. The question in the chat. Uh, from James Ratner. Uh, all writing is to some extent autobiographical. With that in mind, how is one of the greatest tragedies in your life reflected in what you wrote in this book? And I'm referring to the 1986 World Series. Professor <laughs> <laughs> Meredith Rapp was also um, a good professor who shared this case. Cruel sense of humor. No, <laughs> um, there was some autobiography here. I mean, and, and, and it is in in little snippets like we just tell a story about a lawyer and okay maybe it really happened to me 
<laughs> um, so there's a little snippet in there, and I love this moment in court. Um, we were representing kids in, in the child and family law clinic, and we had a kid who was turning 18, great kid, terrific kid. And she was aging out of the system, and, and her judge just really wanted to have one final goodbye to her because she'd been in the system for a long time. And we show up in court, and it's really just like two days before her 18th birthday, so jurisdiction will end. And, and her mother showed up, and her mother, she and her mother kept in touch. She was never adopted by anybody else. She was too old to want to do that. And uh, the judge all of a sudden got nervous and said, oh, wait a minute, your lawyer's not here. And the mother stood up and said, um, oh, no, don't you remember, Judge, the last time I was here, my lawyer relieved himself? <laughs> and then uh, repeated it with more enthusiastic. He believed himself right here. <laughs> I find those things incredibly humorous. I had a really hard time not diving under the desk and not just laugh out loud. And it, 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 it just kept a straight face to his credit. Um, but, but yeah, stuff like that ends up being part of what you do. Or even our, our advice about listening, because I can tell you there are occasions in my career where I felt, oh my God, I didn't really understand what my client wanted, and I went down the wrong pathway, and that just caused a lot of, really disturbed my clients, but they were upset, and rightfully so, because they didn't, they didn't pay enough attention. So yeah, everything's autobiographical, and um, they may have lost the 1986 World Series, they have won. A number of them in this century, unlike anything from New York. Mic drop. Any other questions? All right. Well, if there's no more questions, are there any final remarks? With that? I will thank you both for coming. Well, I can move Have fun. <laughs> it's hard, but have fun. It's okay to have fun. There's nothing wrong with lawyers having fun. All those lawyer jokes. What do you do with lawyer jokes? Okay, perfect. Uh, <laughs> what do lawyers use for work and fun? <laughs> Their personality. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be that lawyer. <laughs>